stand on our feet as we read the Word of God together. Tonight's passage is one that I think that's very familiar if you grew up in church. You at least heard someone quote this to you, even if you don't grow up in church. Okay, in Matthew chapter 7, I'm going to read together from verse 1 to verse 6. Let's do it in count of three. One, two, three. Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your word. We know that this word has power to radically transform us, Lord, as we uh, correctly understand what you are saying to us. So help us, Holy Spirit, to truly understand what it is that you try to say to us. And use my limited word, Lord. Use my weakness to communicate your unlimitedness, your strength, and your grace, and your power to your people. And we need that, Holy Spirit, because I can speak on and on and on, and it means nothing if you're not working in the midst of our hearts. So do that, Holy Spirit. Open our eyes to be able to see your beauty and transform us by the beauty of the gospel. And we ask this in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You guys may be seated. All right. I need you guys to help me preach today. Be noisy, as noisy as you can. Give me strength. I am a bit tired already, okay? Some of you guys, what? Okay, let, let me try this. Can you guys say amen? Can we practice that? Amen. amen. All right. So we tried that last week, right? Amen, amen. So I love that when people actually um, talk back to me during the sermon. So feel free to say amen. Okay, let's, let's practice one more time. Amen, guys? Amen. amen, all right? All right. Let me start with a question then. How many of you guys believe that Christians should not judge other people? Raise your hand. Christians should not judge. Okay, raise your hand high and proud. Okay. How many of you believe that Christians should judge other people? Raise your hand. A few of you. Now, this is very interesting because I, I just did a s- quick poll on Instagram last night. And about 75% said that Christian should not judge other people. And I have a holy Instagram, meaning that 99% of my followers are Christian. Okay? So, and then this verse, Matthew 7, verse 1, is actually one of probably the most favorite verse of non Christian. If non Christian can ever quote the Bible to you, it will be this verse. That is, do not judge. Okay? So, for example, if you talk to someone who practices homosexuality, okay, you talk to them and tell them, mate, you're wrong. Okay, and God is not happy with you. God is angry at your sin. Do you know the first thing that we'll say? They say this. Yo, bro, don't judge me. I mean, who are you to tell me that I'm wrong? Who are you to tell me what to do with my life? This is my life, and I get to decide what I do with it. In fact, doesn't Jesus say, judge not? So stop judging me. Mind your own business. Am I right? So this verse is a lot of time used by non-Christians to quote to us. They quote the Bible to us. And the premise of their culture, the premise of our culture is this. We should never ever question other people's life. We should never tell people that they're wrong. But let me tell you, it does not work. Do you know why? Simple logic. Because when we say that we should never tell other people that they're wrong, at that moment, we are telling the people who tell us that we're wrong that they are wrong for telling us that we are wrong. Okay, how many of you are confused with the wrong that I say? But you, you get what I mean, right? It does not work. The logic does not work. This means we are, if we tell some people, you're wrong for telling me that I, what I do is wrong, we are doing the very thing we said we're not supposed to do. It does not work. And what makes it worse, I think, is many Christians then adopt the exact same stance, but they use the Christianized version of it. Okay, this is the Christianized version. We say things like, seriously, man, who am I to judge other people? I have a lot of mess in my own life. 
I am no better than other people. Let them take care of their mess. Let me take care of my mess. Rather than judging them, I choose to love them. Oh, isn't that sweet? I mean, that's a lot of things that what Christians say, right? I mean, it sounds very spiritual, humble. Okay, let's do some confession. We're a church. How many of you ever said or taught that? Raise your hand. Okay, I think if we're honest, all of us does. But is that what Jesus is saying to us? That's the question. Because I really want us to get into this passage and understand what is Jesus saying in this passage. Because in first one, you see that Jesus said, judge not. So in one sense, Jesus said, okay, don't judge people, guys. But then in verse 6, Jesus called people dogs and pigs. So basically, Jesus said, don't judge people, you dog. Don't judge people, you pig. I mean, that's really what he's saying. So with another word, Jesus actually judged people when he called them dogs and pig. Now what happened? Is Jesus contradicting himself then? Well, the answer is no. Okay, and I'm going to show you why. There's a very, very important lesson in these six verses on what Jesus wants to teach us on how we relate to one another. And I think this lesson is absolutely important for us as a Christian if we want to grow together as righteous sinners. Because remember, we've been talking this about this for a couple of weeks. That Christian, we are righteous sinners. In one hand, we are righteous. The blood of Jesus makes us righteous right now. Not because of our performance, but because of Jesus. But on the other hand, we are still sinners who struggle with sin every day. Okay? So in one sense, yeah, we are righteous. And in one sense, we are sinful. And it does not matter how long we've been Christian. That title, Righteous Sinners, Stick with us for the rest of our life. As long as we're still breathing on this earth, we are righteous sinners. Believing in the gospel does not make us soft on sin. But believing in the gospel actually empowers us to wage war against sins in our life. And here's the truth about every Christian, okay? This is a fundamental truth that we all know. Every Christian has blind spot. That is why we desperately need other people to point out our sin to us. We need one another to grow together in the gospel. Can I have amen? Amen. amen. Okay, that's good. I'm liking it more and more. But I like it even more if you say amen without me asking, can I have amen? Okay, that's even better. Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about this. How can we relate to one another better? Okay, and what does this passage teach us about growing together as righteous sinners? I have three points to my sermon. A judge, a hypocrite, and a brother. Let's look at the first one, a judge. First one and two. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So right off the bat, we, we have to ask the question, what does Jesus mean when he said, judge not that you be not judged? Well, it cannot mean that Jesus said we should not evaluate other people. It cannot mean that we should switch off our brain and critical faculties. It cannot mean we turn blind eyes to people's fault. Well, how do we know? Because Jesus himself called people dogs and pigs. So he did some kind of negative evaluation on other people. And if we pay attention to the context of this sermon, of this passage, this passage is given in the light of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Now, if you do not know Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, basically throughout the sermon, Jesus is teaching Christians to have discernment okay so jesus actually told people listen guys listen christian you have to have discernment for example you have to know to discern between true false prophet and false prophet that means we gotta make evaluation we gotta use our critical faculties and how do you do that and jesus give us a standard so jesus said this is how you know between the good prophet and the false prophet by how by their fruits so if a tree have a healthy, uh, if a tree have a, a good fruit, then that tree is healthy. But if that if a tree has a bad fruit, then that tree is not healthy. So you gotta use your discernment. You gotta think. So that means the word "judge not" cannot mean that we should never make evaluation on other people. So what does it mean then? Look at verse two. I mean, sorry. Look at John seven verse twenty four. This is what Jesus say. Do not judge by appearances. By judge with what? The right judgment. So this is what Jesus says. So as Christians, we are called to judge. Oh yes, we are called to evaluate other people. Yes, but 
Jesus say you got to do it with the right judgment. So Jesus is not forbidding criticism or making a judgment. See, what Jesus is forbidding in his something worse than that. So what Jesus is condemning in Matthew 7 is not the fact that we're judging other people, but what he's condemning is judgmentalism. Okay, what is judgmentalism? Is this. It's the attitude that seeks to find people for, for pleasure. It is to see people in their worst possible motive. It is the kind of judgment that has no concern in helping others but condemning others. Okay, Martin Lloyd Jones put it nicely. He put it this way. The fact of the matter is that we're not really concerned helping this other person. We are interested only in condemning him. We pretend to have this great interest. We pretend that we are very distressed at finding this blemish. But in reality, as our Lord has already shown us, we are really glad to discover it. Okay, this is what judgmentalism is. Okay, let me give you an example. There's a story of a young bachelor who struggled to find a wife. Every time he brought a prospective wife home, his mom criticized her harshly. His mom condemned every single girl he brought home. Just to be clear, I'm not talking about me. <laughs> so the young man was frustrated, okay? And he sought advice from his friend. And his friend advised him, his thing, why don't you find a girl like your mom? Okay, and the young man, oh, this is a good idea. So then he searched, he searched eHarmony, Tinder, whatever it is, until he found a girl just like her mom. She looked like her mom. She talked like his mom. She thought like her mom. She even complained and criticized like his mom. I mean, the similarity was amazing. So he took her home to meet his mom. A few days later, he met his friend who gave him the advice. And his friend asked, so how did it go? Did your mom like her? And the young man replied, it was great. My mom absolutely loved her. But there's one problem. My dad could not stand her. <laughs> we understand this. I mean, there are few things in life more exhausting than harsh, unloving, fault-finding criticism. And this is what Jesus is against. Okay, let's continue in verse 2. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Okay? Then there are two layers here of meaning. There's a warning from Jesus. There's two layers. The first layer is this. The standard of measurement that we use toward others function like a boomerang. The way we judge others will be the way others judge us. So that means we should not complain if other people judge us using the standard of measurement we use against them. You with me on that? That's the first meaning. But I think what Jesus is getting at is actually the second meaning. I incline to believe this is the point that Jesus is making. Jesus says this, the standard of measurement by which we judge other people is the standard by which God judge us. Because think about it. God is the only one who has the right to set the standard of measurement by which we judge others. So if we try to play judge and create our own standard, then we cannot plead ignorance of the standard on which we judge other people. And the fact of the matter is here. We are guilty of the very same thing we judge other people. Isn't that true? Let me give you an example. All of us experience this, okay? How many of you ever get annoyed at a car that sped right past you? Okay? I mean, that dude just drove 100k per hour. Crazy! I hope there's a cop around the corner. He needs to learn his lesson. Isn't that what we say? Yet, we don't seem to mind when we are the one in a hurry and we get away with it. What about this one? We heard a powerful sermon in the church, and we immediately thought, huh, I wish my mom is here to listen to it. Or I wish Bob is here. I wish this guy or that dude is here to listen to the sermon. What happened? 
So the moment we listen to the sermon, rather than applying the sermon to us to ourselves, we immediately say, huh, this sermon is good for these other people, for that people. So we judge other people. And the point that Jesus is making is that if we measure others by standard, it shows that we already accept that standard. And God can judge us by that standard. But the truth is, the truth is, we often don't know all the facts. And we should never assume the worst in others. Only God knows everything. So our role is actually, therefore, we should assume the best in other people. And once again, this is not a command to not make a judgment. But this is a command to be very generous in our evaluation of other people. Whenever possible, we should give others the benefit of a doubt. This command is for us to not play judge. Why? Because you get it, this God is the only one who has the right to judge. And the way we evaluate others must reflect God's standards of measurement. Okay, you with me so far? So we, call, we are called to judge other people, but then we got to do it in such a way that we use God's standard of measurement and we always assume the best in other people. Okay, that's the first one. Okay, that's hard already. I'm like, Ooh, this is really hard. Wait. Second one, a hypocrite. First three to first four. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is the log in your own eye? Now, this is a strong warning. If the first warning is a warning against a plain judge, the second warning is a warning against hypocrisy. Now look at the image that Jesus gave us. So basically, we see a friend that has a splinter in his eye. Now what happens when you have splinter in your eye? Here's what happened. It destroys your ability to see. Okay? So your eye becomes watery and it is painful. And this is a picture of sin in our life. Because sin destroys our ability to see clearly. Let me give you an example. Let's say a girl is badly hurt by her father in the past. Maybe her dad walked away from the family or her dad uh, cheated her mom, I don't know. But she was very bitter toward her dad. And what the girl often can't see is that bitterness actually affects the way that she sees men in general. So now she's bitter towards all men and she can't see clearly. Because she has this distorted view of men and because of that her relationship with men are distorted. But here's the thing. She can't see it. We can. Other people can, but she cannot see it. So someone needs to tell her, hey, you have an issue. You have a problem. But it won't be easy. Do you know why? Think about it. How do we get a splinter out from someone's eye? Well, some of you say, it's easy. You just get a mirror and do it yourself. The problem is, in that culture, only super rich people have mirror. And even if she has mirror, think about it, it is very hard for her to get the splinter out of her eye. Because why? Because she can't see clearly in the first place. Right? How are you supposed to take splinter out of your eyes when you can't even see clearly in the first place? So what, in other words, what Jesus is saying is this. In order for her to get the splinter out, it is impossible for her to do it on her own. She needs someone else to help her get it out. And that is actually the picture of sin and splinter in our life. We desperately need other people to get the splinter out of our eyes. We need other people to point out our sin and our sin blind spot. Because why? Sin has affected our ability to see clearly. We cannot do it on our own. We need other people to make evaluation of us and tell us, listen, yours, I think you're wrong. Okay? And so we need that people in our life. But here's the thing about it. Those people need to do it very gently. Think about it. How do you remove a speck from people's eyes? How do you do that? Do you get a hammer and start to chisel in? Pa, 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 pa. No, right? That's like killing the eye. That's like killing the person. We need to do it very gently and slowly. And this is the image that Jesus gave us on how we should tell other people of their sin. Not harshly, but gently. But how? Here's the key. How can we 
do it gently. And Jesus said, in order for us to be able to do it gently, we must first do something else. And this is where it gets very comical. Verse 3. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? So the image is this. So we see, we see a splinter in our friend's eye, and we say, hey, Josh, excuse me, Josh, I think I see a splinter in your eye. Let me help you with it. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a tree from my eyes. That's the picture that Jesus gave us. So you, how on earth are you supposed to help people get the splinter out of their eyes if you have a tree in your eye? So Jesus is rebuking people who are far more aware of other people's sin than they are of their own. And that is so true about every single one of us. We are expert at finding fault at other people, but we are very slow in dealing with our own fault. We exaggerate the fault of our husband, of our wife, but we will minimize our own fault. We view other people in the worst light possible, but we want other people to view us in the best light possible. And there is a word that describes this. Do you know what that word? Hypocrite. And Jesus is telling us in this verse, stop being a hypocrite. Before we help other people with their spec, we must first remove the lock in our own eye. And in Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells this parable. You know this parable. It's one of the most popular parables about a tax collector and a Pharisee. So both of them went up to the temple to pray. And the Pharisees, he prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like Bob. I mean, did you see what happened with Bob? Just for your information, I think he's cheating on his wife. I saw him with another girl at the bar last week, midnight. But God... I'm not like him. I am faithful to my wife. I am honest with my work. When everybody else watch YouTube at work, I refuse to use my work hours for entertainment. I always drive under speed limit. I don't text and drive like most people. I don't lie and I don't get drunk. And I'm especially not like this dude, the tax collector next to me. He is the worst of all sinners. He's Bob times million. That's a Pharisee. While the tax collector simply prayed, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And you know what Jesus said? Luke 18, verse 14. And I tell you, this man, being the tax collector, went down to his house justified, rather than the other Pharisees. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. And this is shocking. So Jesus says, listen, the person who has more sin, the person who's actually a lot worse is the one who goes home righteous, justified. Do you know what is the problem with the Pharisee? Here's the problem with the Pharisee. Despite all his goodness, he's blind to his own sin. He does not realize how self-righteous he is. While on the other hand, <laughs> The tax collector recognizes his sin, while the while Pharisee is too focused on other people's sin that he's blind to his own sin. And this is what Jesus is getting at. See, we often, you and I, often see other people's sin as a lock, and then we are very lenient toward our own sin, but we are very harsh toward other people's sin. And what Jesus says is, you gotta do it the opposite, the other way around. We should consider our sins to be large and other sins to be small. We should be far more concerned with sins in our life than we are with sin in others. And this is very crucial because unless we see our sins greater than other people's sin, you will not be able to treat them in gentleness. Because if you think that you are better than other people, you will treat them from a place of superiority and you will play judge instead of helping them. And here, Jesus wants to awaken us to the fact, listen guys, we are more proud, we are more self-centered, we are more petty than we dare to acknowledge. And until we acknowledge the lock in our own eye, we're no good for other people. Until we are humbled by our own sinfulness, 
we cannot help other people with their sin. Pastor Tony Evans made a very interesting observation on these verses. Okay? Brilliant insight. He asked this question. Do you know why it is very easy for us to recognize the splinter in other people's eye while we have a lock in our own eye? He said it was because both the splinter and the lock came from the same source. When we see someone criticizing the same thing over and over and over again in someone else, that because what they're looking at is right in front of their own eye. They are very familiar with it. Okay, this is what he said. The reason we are very good at spotting particular sin in other people's life is because we are very familiar with it in our own life. Okay, he went on to say, okay, it's painful. We tend to criticize most of our own deepest weaknesses because when we see it in others, even if it's only a splinter of wood, it reminds us of the lock that we're dealing with every day. And when I read that, I'm like, ouch. Okay. Remember what happened to King David. Okay. If you do not know who King David is, King David is probably the most popular king in Israel history. But this king has a big, big flaw. What happened is, one time, King David slept with another man's wife, killed her husband, and tried to hide it from everyone. And then one day, Nathan the prophet came to him and said, Hey, David, king, I have a problem, and I need your help. And David, all right, what's the problem? Here's the problem. Two men were living in the same town. One was very rich, and the other was poor. The rich man had many lambs, while the poor man only had one single little lamb that he cherished. He cuddled with this little lamb every night. It was like a daughter to him. Then one day, the rich guy had a friend coming out of, from out of town, and he wanted to throw a party for his friend. But instead of taking one of his many lamb, he took the poor man's little lamb and made a lamb chop out of it. King David, what do you think we should do with this rich man. And David get angry, and David said, what? Kill him. And Nathan replied, are you sure? Because you are that man. You had many wives, David, but you took another man's wife and killed her husband. And if you think the rich man should die for what he did, what about you? What you did is far worse than stealing a little lamb. And here's the point. Can you see why David is so angered by this man? Because the law of Moses only required the rich man to pay for what he took from the poor man, plus interest, not a death penalty. But David wanted to kill the rich man. Why? Because he saw his own reflection in that story. He saw the speck because he had the lock. And that is called hypocrisy. So what is the solution then? We shall not be a judge. We shall not be a hypocrite. So what do we do? Let's move on to the third point. A brother. Matthew 7, verse 5 and 6. You hypocrite, first take the lock out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. So here's Jesus' solution. Bread tacking. His solution is not for you to mind your own business. The answer is not for us to deal with our own sin and not worry about other people's sin. That is not the solution Jesus offers. Because according to Jesus, the only solution is for us to be a brother. You know what a brother does? A brother cares for his, the well-being of his sibling. A brother cares about the speck in the eyes of his sibling. And a brother knows he has the responsibility to help his sibling. But in order to do so, he must first acknowledge the lock in his own eye and remove it. Because until he removes the lock in his own eye, he will not be able to see clearly and he will not be able to help his sibling. And this is what Jesus is teaching us in this passage. 
Jesus is not telling us to never judge other people, but he's telling us to deal with our own eye trouble first before we try to help other people with their eye trouble. What Jesus condemned in this passage is not the act of judging others, but when we judge other people without first correcting ourselves. Because you and I, we cannot help other people with their spec until we remove the lock out of our own eye. I mean, you understand this. This is common sense, right? When we get on a plane, you know, before the planes take off, they always give us the same instruction. And one instruction that always confused me in the past is this, the one about oxygen mass. They say, in the case of emergency and the mask fall down, we must first put the mask over our face before we help other people, including little children. I used to think when I was young, that's selfish. Why would the adult protest helping themselves over me? But how many of you realized that I was dumb? Because we understand today that the most loving thing we can do for people around us is actually to put on our oxygen mask first. Because if we don't, we might be the one who needs help from other people in the next few minutes. In trying to fix everybody else, we might be the one who needs help because we don't have the oxygen mask on us. But, Jesus said, if we fix ourselves first, then we can help other people. And this is what it means to be a brother. Get this. A brother is someone with the humility to acknowledge his own sinfulness and deal with it. And because of it, he can help remove the speck on other people's eye with kindness and gentleness. You with me? Okay. But what is the most puzzling out of this passage is what Jesus said next. Verse 6. Do not give dogs what is holy. And do not throw your pulse before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. When I first read this, I had no idea what it meant. I read commentaries, and I found out that this verse is highly debated. Well, first, Jesus just break our social norm. He called people dog and pigs. Word of advice. Unless your name is Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, do not call anyone dog or pigs. It won't go well. But second, the question is this, who are the dogs and pigs? Okay, here's my problem. And there are a couple of inter interpretations. Okay, but look at the image that Jesus gave us. So the image is like this. So one day we're holding a bag of precious pearls, and we are surrounded by hungry dogs and pigs. And as those animals glare hungrily at us. We take out our pearls and sprinkle them on the ground. And thinking that we sprinkle some food, the animals start to eat them. But then when they eat them, they find out that the pearls are too hard to chew and have no taste. So the animals get angry, spit out the pearls, and turn on us and attack us. They think, I can't eat this junk, but at least I can eat this person, okay? That's the image Jesus gave us. So here's the question. Who are the dogs and pigs? Now, some commentators suggest that these animals refer to people who can't accept criticism. So they say this, you should not waste your time with people who cannot accept criticism. But I have a really hard time accepting this interpretation. Why? Because the rest of the Bible seems to suggest otherwise. We should never give up on helping other people deal with their sin. We have to sacrifice ourselves for their good. Okay, that's the Bible. So I'm like, no, this, this cannot be it. Second interpretation. And this is the most popular one. Most popular one. Almost all commentaries go on this side. And he says this that this pearl actually represent the gospel. Because in Matthew 13, Jesus tell another parable about pearls. And the pearls in that parable refer to the gospel of the kingdom of God. So in Matthew 7, the dogs and pigs refer to the unbelievers who consistently and persistently reject the gospel. So they say, 
the meaning of this verse is this. We, it's not that we should not share the gospel with unbeliever, but they say there are just some unbelievers who are just beyond help, and we should not waste our time with them. Once again, I have a really hard time accepting this interpretation. Because the Bible seems to tell us that there's no heart to heart for the grace of God to work. There's no heart to heart that the grace of God cannot break. That means we should never give up on anyone's salvation to their very last breath. So I was in limbo for quite some time, right? I don't know how to interpret this verse until I receive help. Now, I wish I can say I prayed, I meditated, and asked God, Lord, please help me understand this passage. And one day suddenly the Holy Spirit opened my eyes, and then he sent Gabriel, angel, Yossi, this is what it means. I wish I can say that. But no. Yes, the Holy Spirit opened my eyes to understand this passage, but the one that helped me is not Gabriel. Rather, a bold old angel by the name of Timothy Keller. Keller said, what Jesus is trying to teach us in this verse is to have discernment. Two things. First, we must have discernment on how to speak the gospel truth to other people. Think about it. Who is at fault in this metaphor? Is it the dogs and pigs or the person who throws pearls at them? The dogs and pigs, they do not know better. It is in their nature to eat whatever is thrown at them. But the person should have known better. I mean, why on earth would you throw expensive, precious items to dogs and pigs? It does not make any sense. The animals, they do not have the sense to perceive the value of the pulse. They don't have the capacity for it. And Keller said that the gospel truth does not make any sense unless God is helping us from the inside. It is only when God works in the heart of the people that they can perceive the true value of the gospel. So what Keller says is, if you try to push the gospel truth into people's throat and say, this is the gospel, this is the truth, you must believe it, you must accept it, how can you be so dumb and not believe it? And they're angry at us. The one who is at fault is not them, it's us. Why? Because we are trying to make dead people come alive on our own. It is impossible. Dogs and pigs cannot perceive the value of the fall. That's the first one. But the second one is this, that we need to honor the pace of God and people's life. Because the truth is this, everyone is on their journey. And it is my job it is your job to be as sensitive as we can to where they are on the journey. Because we can't push people to trust the gospel, to embrace the gospel of truth when they can't even digest it. Let me give you one story. Um, there's one older minister who shared how he came to understand the gospel. So basically this minister, he was raised in a church and he never seems to get the gospel. In fact, he went to graduate school and took courses in religion and theology. But he did not get the gospel. And then he went to Air Force, and the Air Force chaplain led him to faith in Christ. So the Air Force chaplain told him the gospel. Listen, this is the gospel. Jesus, the Holy Son of God, died for your sin. And because of Jesus now, salvation is by grace through faith alone. And the moment that you put your faith in Jesus, you are forgiven of all your sin and you're made righteous in that moment once for all. And this minister is like, oh my gosh, this is like the greatest news ever. And he was moved, he was moved and amazed by the truth. And he thought, all my life I grew up in church. I have never listened to the gospel before. I thought I have to live as good as I can so that God, maybe, maybe God will accept me into heaven. He never realized that salvation is by grace alone. And finally, for the first time in his life, he embraced the gospel. Okay? So for the next few weeks, what happened is, is you know, people when they first encountered the gospel, they were very eager. So he began to read everything about the gospel. He began to learn everything of the gospel. He began to have conversation with the chaplain. And at one point, he said to the chaplain, you know what? I grew up in church all my life. 
I took courses on theology, but no one ever tell me the gospel like you did. None of the preachers, none of the professors, none of the book. Then he continued. But what I want to know is why Martin Luther did not know anything about the gospel. And the chaplain like, what? Say it again. Yeah, why Martin Luther did not know anything about the gospel? And he asked, why do you say that? And this man replied, well, because a year ago, I took a course on the Reformation, and I read a book by Martin Luther, and he never said anything about the gospel in his book. And the chaplain said, uh, you might want to reread that book. So he did. And to his surprise, he found out that almost on every page, he had underlined and highlighted the gospel, and he did not see it. Because why? Because his eyes weren't open to it. It was like those dogs and pigs who cannot appreciate the value and the beauty of the pearls, even though it was right in front of their eyes. And you see what happened? Isn't that true about us, for many of us? We've been Christian for many years. I mean, maybe we hear the gospel, but we never actually perceive its value. It's not only that minister's story. In fact, a few months ago, someone who used to attend our church many years ago, at the time we still call RYI, messaged me. And he shared with me how the gospel transformed his life in the last few years. Like, I was happy every time I get that message. Awesome, awesome, powerful, yes, amen, right? Then he said to me, Well, Ko, I heard that you recently started to preach the gospel as well. It is awesome. I'm very excited at the future of Rock City International. And I thought to myself, what? What do you mean I recently started to preach the gospel? Yo, bro, I've been preaching the gospel when you were at church, right? I preach this every single week. But then when I read this verse, it makes sense to me. He's on a journey. And when he was with us, he was not there yet. So we need to discern where people are in life. And we cannot read to people the same. Everyone is on their own journey, and we must be sensitive to that. Are you with me so far? So let's put this together into one. Okay, let me summarize for you. What is Jesus actually teach us in this passage? Three things. First, we must evaluate people based on God's standard of measurement. And it is right for us to do so. We have to judge people. We have to do that using God's standard of measurement. Well, second, but then we must speak the truth and help other people deal with their sin. And we must do so with kindness and gentleness. And to do that, we must first be aware of our own sinfulness. We must be humbled by it, and only then we can help other people deal with their sin. And third, we must have discernment in administering the gospel to other people. So yes, we must tell people the truth, but we must do so with gentleness, kindness, and sensitivity to where they are on the journey. So we've got to be patient with them. We can't force people to swallow the truth when they're not ready. Because we need to remember, even our faith, our own faith, is a miracle. The fact that you right now embrace the gospel and you perceive the beauty of the gospel and captivated by the gospel is because God has done a supernatural work inside of us. That's the only reason. It is a miracle. But do you start to realize how difficult it is then right now? Because in one degree, we're called to engage with other people, to talk to other people, to rebuke other people, do it with kindness, gentleness, but we have to have the sensitivity. They might reject us. They might misunderstood us. They might you know, get offended at us. And the question is, how am I supposed to do this? This is impossible, Jesus. To have the heart to continue to engage other sinners and correct them with gentleness and kindness is risky. Because it is very possible for them to attack us again and again. So here's the question, and I'm done. How do we have the heart for it? The answer is simple. 
The only answer, how can we have the heart to do this, is this. You have to look at the ultimate pearl of the universe. Because Colossians chapter 2 tells us that in Jesus is hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. With another word, Jesus Christ is the treasure of all treasures. Jesus Christ is the pearl of all pearls. Jesus is the embodiment of the ultimate pearl of the universe. And then this pearl was over to us. God the Father gave this pearl to us. And Jesus knew if he came to earth, we would trample on him. Because we have no sense to perceive his value and beauty. We are like those dogs and pigs who trample on poles. We turn on Jesus and attack Jesus. And that's why Jesus died. And yet Jesus willingly gave his life for us. Why? Because he understands one thing. Jesus knew that the only way that he can turn dogs and pigs into sons and daughters of God is by letting us trample on him. There's no other way. So Jesus offered himself because he had to pay the penalty of our sin. And he needed to do that so that God can forgive us of our sin. And we can be accepted in God's presence. Here's a question. If you can see that, if you can see what Jesus has done for you, then you start to realize, actually, doing the same to other people is not as hard. Because they... You might, they might get offended at you, but at least they won't kill you. They won't crucify you. So the only way that we can do this is we are melted by the beauty of the grace of God. Because only when we are melted by the beauty of the gospel, it transforms us from pigs and dogs into children. And the more we gaze at the beauty of God, the more we are aware of our own sinfulness, and the more amazed we are at the grace of God. And this is what enables us to gently help other people. To the degree that we are captivated by what Jesus has done for us at the cross, to that degree we can help other people see the beauty of the gospel. So that's my heart for you, church. I want us to be a community who actually engage in one another's life, who actually get involved in one another's mess, who actually rebuke one another, make evaluation, judge, and then help one another deal with their sin. Oh, yes, it's going to be painful. Yes, it's going to be messy. But yet, at the same time, whenever we gaze on Jesus, we find reason to do it. So let us be a community who gaze on Jesus and help one another to do the same. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for you have given us the very pearl of the universe, that you gave us the ultimate pearl of the universe that we may live. So God, for the time and again and again that we forgot that, for the time and again and again, Lord, that we are more consumed in other people's fault and sin, forgive us. But help us realize that our sins are far greater and larger. And yet your grace is even larger than that. And I pray that it will humble us. And it will amaze us once again to your grace and to your beauty. And when we do that, I pray that we have the gentleness and the kindness to help other people deal with their sin. Help us be a community that love one another. And we ask this, Lord, because Holy Spirit, you are the only one who can make this happen in us. Do that in our midst. We want to be a community of righteous sinners. We want to grow together. And we want the gospel be made known in and through one another's life. And we ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.